Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Belvin Perry Jr., retired Chief Justice of the Florida Ninth Judicial Circuit. Belvin was the 2014 recipient of the Arthur Pappy Kennedy Lifetime Achievement Award. Good morning. Come on, you can do better. Good morning. You know, it is an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to introduce today's keynote speaker. In a decisive moment, you can either define the moment or let the moment define you. That simple but profound quote defines our speaker and that is the mantra that he lives by. Calvin Hayes is an alumni of the YMCA's Teen Achievers Program and a fellow alumni of the Mighty Jones High School. I first met this young man in his freshman year at Jones High School. Paul Sneed and I interviewed him and made him a part of our 100 Black Men Project Success at Jones High. And Calvin, back in those days, was a shining star. As a student at Jones High School, he was wise beyond his years. And we had the privilege of being a part of his life throughout high school and college. Calvin is a graduate of the Florida a &M University and holds a master's degree in international communications and public diplomacy from American University. He is a published author and founder of the Define Movement Enterprises. Throughout my life, I've had the distinct pleasure of meeting with and working with alongside many great leaders and truly great Americans. Today, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see and hear a truly great leader and a truly great American. The words United States diplomat, orator, activist, author, and minister are not often found in one individual. But this young man, Calvin Hayes, is the exception to the rule. He has always believed that to accomplish great things, you must dream and act as well. For when that decisive moment comes, and it will come, you must either define the moment or it will define you. Calvin Hayes has learned in his life to define the moment and not let the moment define him. He's a leader beginning with his days at Jones High School, and most importantly, he's a learner, willing to listen and learn from those who could impart information to him. Our speaker has traveled nearly 40 countries around the globe, and as a part of his work with the United States Department of State, he has worked in Northeast Africa on human rights and food security issues. Currently, he serves as an American diplomat at the United States Embassy in Bogota, Colombia. In this role, he's responsible for facilitating millions of dollars in business investments and trade between Colombia and the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride that I present to you United States diplomat, Mr. Calvin Hayes, a man who always defines the moment. I have just but one minute. 
60 seconds pressed in it. I didn't seek it, nor did I choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Good morning. I think we could do a little bit better than that. Good morning. Good morning. For this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I am so grateful to be back here in the wonderful city of Orlando, Florida, a, a city that gave me wings and allowed me to fly, a city that raised me to be the old man that I am today. <laughs> and y'all, after 30 years, old years on this planet, I can truly say that there is no place like Orlando. And I don't say that just because of the theme parks. I say that because of the village that exists here. As I look out into the audience, I see so many friends and supporters. I see organizations, particularly the YMCA of Orlando, uh, the YMCA that made sure that I was exposed to higher education, took me on a college tour, and made sure that I had enough community service hours to get into schools like Princeton, Vanderbilt, Brown University, and ultimately Florida a and University. I'm extremely grateful for all the elected and public officials here and for the leadership team of the YMCA, even Mr. Dan Wilcox, who has been a great supporter from my early days when uh, I used to compete against his son in the 800 meter run in high school. <laughs> <laughs> but as I look out into the audience, I also see other folks. I see men. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the 100 black men of Orlando. And these men, Mr. Sneed, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Perry, and so many others. These men not only wore suits, but these men, they gave me a suit and taught me how to tie a tie so that I don't, not only could be somebody, but so that I could look like somebody. And the, one of the, <laughs> and I'm so happy that, that those, those suits came with a great accessory. Uh, in the pockets that came with a scholarship every year to make sure that I graduated debt-free. So thank you so much to the 100 Black Men of Orlando. <laughs> and for the all tied up uh, dress store for keeping me fresh all day, all night. <laughs> also want to thank Mayor Dyer, wonderful leader. Thank you so much for your sacrifice, sir over the years, it was because of uh, the mayor's office in Orlando that even before I graduated from college, I had a professional internship in his communications office, and I had a little something to put on my resume before I graduated from college. So, uh, so grateful for the mayor's office. I'm also pleased to have my family here. Uh, they're over here at the table, if they don't mind standing. I have my mom, my dad, my grandmothers, my aunts. Uh, I have my in-laws there, my dad, best, electric, best electrician in this city. Uh, uh, but I also see uh, best friends and supporters, Neil and his wife, and my other best friend, uh, Elliot, that's here. Um, but on a real note, uh, I did not have to look uh, outside of my home for a, a role model. You know, some folks have to look in a magazine or go to the movie theater uh, to find that hero. I'm so grateful that I had that hero and my mother. And my mother, we didn't have much. Uh, but she sacrificed uh, every last dime to make sure that we could succeed. And um, I have to be very transparent with you this morning. Is it okay if I be transparent with you? All right, well, early on, you know, you guys know I graduated from uh, the best high school in the world, Jones High School. Uh, and I matriculated to Florida A&M University, the best university in the country. I don't know if there's any doctors in the room, but anybody that disputes those two facts should be checked out immediately. Okay, so everything was going well my freshman year of college. But then my sophomore year of college, I'll never forget it, uh, almost feels like yesterday, and I was having a deep conversation on campus with a friend. And I had a, a, a severe 
injury that happened to me. I was standing in front of this place called the Grand Ballroom and uh, almost had to be rushed to the hospital. Uh, the reason being is because as I was standing on campus, a bad and beautiful young lady by the name of Kendall Sunshine Johnson walked by me <laughs> and my neck almost snapped out of place. <laughs> and so at the time her name was Kendall Sunshine Johnson, but at that moment I knew that I wanted to change her name, no disrespect to my in-laws, to Ken Kendall Sunshine Hayes. <laughs> and y'all, 10 years later she still has my neck turning. Y'all, if you would loan me a little bit of your time this morning, and I would like to speak from the title, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. <laughs> if you've already had your coffee from Wawa and it's not too early for you, and you don't feel too bougie, please turn and tell your neighbor, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. Sitting on the dock of the bay. Mayor Dyer, that's your neighbor, say it, Sit on the Dock of the Bay. <laughs> Uh, sitting on the dock of the bay, a great song that was written in the great heyday of my generation. And you young folks like Mina Ford or uh, Ms. Goodwin probably don't know about it. Uh, because you prefer music like Cardi B, the Migos, and Jay-Z. But for some of you who know good music, you're familiar with the, the words of Otis Redding. It stirs something in your soul. It takes you back to a time long ago, hopefully not too long ago, when you used to go to the AMVET VFW Club Eaton and the Rainbow. <laughs> yeah, you thought I didn't know anything about those places. <laughs> and you used to do a little two-step and not have to worry about the injury the next day. And if you're anything like my grandmother, who is a Bible-toting, holy-rolling holy rolling hot mama, <laughs> the words of Otis Redding stir something in your soul. But you know, this morning, it's not the tone of the song that strikes my attention but it's the text of the song that captures my curiosity. And I don't have to sing the words, but Brother Otis says, I'm sitting on the dock of the bay watching the tide roll away. I have nothing to live for because nothing ever comes my way. Looks like nothing's gonna change because everything remains the same. I'm just sitting on the dock of the bay wasting, Time. wasting. Time. Brothers and sisters, go back with me to more than 50 years ago when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was imprisoned in a cold Alabama jail cell. He was left in there for 11 days and for 11 nights without the ability to FaceTime or tweet his family. And some may ask, was he driving with a suspended license? The answer is no. Was his brother late on child support? The answer is still no, but here was a crime that gave him the time. And Dr. King and 50 other protesters have been arrested for being too lit and leading a demonstration to bring national attention to the racist treatment suffered by blacks in one of the most segregated cities in America, Birmingham, Alabama. So for months, they boycotted the city's white owned businesses but failed to achieve any substantive results, leaving them no other choice but to protest. So ignoring a recently passed ordinance that prohibited public gathering without an official permit, they protested and King was thrown in jail for the 13th time. But oh, the story does not end there. Eight local Christian clergy uh, penned a petty letter which criticized the demonstration and Dr. King. They thought his movement was too radical. They thought he was moving a little bit too fast. And so they asked him to slow down, y'all. Uh, they asked him to wait while homes were being bombed, while churches were being bombed, while he received death threats. In a sense, uh, commissioners, they were asking him to sit at the dock of the bay. Uh, but in good Dr. King form, he responded by, by saying, justice too long delayed is justice denied. And an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, sitting on the dock of the bay, a beautiful song but a destructive behavior. Sip on your glass of water with me as we journey through the delusion at that dock, the diversion at that dock, and the devotion to leave that dock. See, delusion can come from a lot of things. If you were watching the football game last night, <laughs> probably got a little delusional. But it can come from drugs, it can come from a nagging boyfriend, girlfriend, we won't go there. 
But often, more often than not, it comes from alcohol. It's alcohol that causes delusion, especially when you are intoxicated. Now, before you throw oranges and apples at me, I'm not saying that you can't drink your Budweiser, Heineken, Coke 45, Grey Goose, Vanilla Crown Royal, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Malbec Merlot. All I'm saying is that I have an uncle that's been int intoxicated once, twice, three, four, maybe five, six times at a, at a family picnic. And the problem with my uncle is uh, every time he shows up to a picnic, I won't say his name because my mom's here and she might uh, get a little mad at me afterwards. <laughs> but you know who he is, mama. <laughs> every time he shows up to the family event, his words start slurring. His vision starts blurring. And he can't tell whether he's coming or going. And if you have a family member like mine, you know that something can happen around them that is harmful to them, and they not even know it. And how does that apply today? At the dock of the bay, thousands of children from Sudan to Syria go to bed hungry every night, and men in Libya are still sold as slaves. And some folks choose to ignore this because it's not harmful to them if it's not happening to them. And at the dock of the bay, the wealth gap continues to grow larger by the minute. But some folks wouldn't know because they live in a good neighborhood. They, their kids attend good schools and not harmful to them uh, because it's not happening to them. At the dock of the bay in 2018, xenophobia, homophobia, and hatred is on the rise. Again, not harmful to some folks because it's not happening to some folks. And sitting on the dock of the bay can intox you, intoxicate you with the alcohol of confusion and chase with a high dosage of delusion to make you think that everything is okay in this world as long as you have what you need. But if I can pull from Dr. King again, what affects one directly affects all indirectly. And we can't be all that we're supposed to be unless our brother and sister is everything that he is called to be. And here in 1963, when Dr. King wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail, the United States of America was ravished by racism, crashed by classism, and massacred by materialism. And I'm sure as Dr. King got word of this criticism, he put his hands through his hair and had to make a critical decision had to figure out would he be silent and sit at the dock of the bay or would he speak up? But Dr. King realized something. He realized that what you don't oppose openly, you affirm silently. <laughs> and we can learn a little bit from the book of Dr. King but the problem is some of us are afraid of speaking up, a little afraid of being ashamed of what people might think of us. And we get loud on the things we should be silent about and silent on the things we should be loud about. And we get loud about the corruption on Wall Street, but we get really silent about the crime on our own streets. We get loud on every kid should go to college uh, but we get silent on how kids are priced out of an education. We get loud on violence and oppression, but silent on gun laws and voter suppression. We get loud on religious differences, but silent on love your neighbor as yourself. And there comes a point in time when the world needs to hear your voice, needs to hear your concern, not the voice of CNN, not the voice of your barber, not the voice of your Aunt Shirley, not the voice of your speechwriter, not the voice of your pastor, not the voice of your Facebook post. Because just because you post about an issue doesn't make you committed to an issue. It's going to take more. Because it's going to take more than tweets to transform our streets. There is violence in your silence. There is exploitation in your silence. There is dis dis discrimination in your silence. There is harassment of women in your silence. How will haters know that their hate is wrong if we remain silent? How will injustice know the depth of its wrong if we remain silent? How will injustice and division and the pain of prejudice know its insult if we remain silent? And it was because of this resistance and moral dissent that even within the YMCA, 
1931, the YMCA's World Conference condemned racial discrimination and passed a resolution to end segregation. And in 1946, the national organization urged local branches to desegregate. So, see, the YMCA refused to be delusional. Because the problem with intoxication, and just like a bad hangover, who's had a bad hangover? Stop, don't raise your hand, don't. <laughs> the problem with a, a bad hangover is that when you wake up, the problem still exists. When you wake up from the hangover, poverty is still on the rise. Kids are growing up without their father's women are not still being paid equal to men. Immigrants are still being mischaracterized as places like Haiti and countries on the continent of Africa are being called out of their name. And so for my brothers and sisters from the continent of Africa, which we all, which we, some of us are the descendants of, and for all the folks that are from Haiti or have friends and family in Haiti, know that we stand with you. So nudge somebody and tell them, don't sit at the bay. <laughs> and the next step is diversion. And we live in a world where any and everything can take our attention. Uh, how many of us have had good intentions but bad follow through? How many, how many of y'all are familiar with the phrase, was going to? I was going to leave work, hop on the East-West Expressway, go to the gym, and go to LA Fitness, but then I passed by the hot and ready sign at Krispy Kremes. <laughs> I was going, I was going to volunteer my time, but then I looked to the, my left, and the Altamont Mall was there, Marshalls and Burlington Coke Factory was there, and I knew that tire dress was calling my name. I was going to volunteer my time, but then my Facebook feed became way too interesting. And my Netflix account, you know I'm paying for it every month, so I, I have to watch that show. And for so many of us in the room, it's not that we don't do enough, it's that we run the risk of doing too much. And we get pulled away from what we are supposed to be focusing on. And between every diversion, we get torn away from our true calling and purpose. Because the truth is this, although service is the rent that we pay to be on this earth, it's very easy to be delinquent on that payment. And problem is, it's not just diversion, it's the damage that happens when we get diverted. Because while we've been diverted, hatred, bigotry, and self-indulgence runs rampant. While we've been diverted, prisons are still overcrowding and voting rights are still up for debate. And while we've been diverted, some kids and some zip codes do not have the same opportunity as their counterparts. And in 2018, it seems though scandals and rumors have caught our attention. Reality shows have overtaken our lives, while the greatest issues of our time get ignored. And social media news, both fake and real, has a way of stealing our attention like the Grinch stole Christmas. And these side shows have a way of mesmerizing and hypnotizing us until we forget what our goal should be. And we can't afford to be diverted, y'all, when we have sick people, rich people, discouraged people, tired people, angry people, excited people, gay people, straight people, haughty people, harassed people, proud people, impatient people, lost people, gentle people, people that need us to be devoted and not diverted. And I'm convinced that when Dr. King could have been diverted, he instead became more devoted. They tried to devote him with, divert him with gossip, but he stayed the course realizing that a man can't talk behind your back if you're standing in front of him. Uh, they tried, Brother Reggie, to divert him with tricks, but he realized that tricks are for kids. They had to divert him with praise, but Dr. King realized that if you live by the applause of men, you'll also die by their criticism. And these distractions divert us in the same way, bring it back, Calvin, to the clergy that was trying to divert Dr. King. And maybe they were seeking to silence his voice to bring more credibility to their criticism. 
But Dr. King did like many of us should do. Instead of straying from the course, he steered the course. And because he steered the course, Mayor Jacobs, a lot of things changed. America changed. Civil rights was passed. Doors of opportunity swung open so that his kids could live in a world where they will be judged by the content of their character. But Dr. King just didn't steer the course blindly. He didn't look at his Google Maps on his iPhone to figure out where to go. But he looked in his metaphorical pocket and he pulled out the blueprint. Somebody say the blueprint. And the blueprint was not written from his hands alone, but from the hands of thousands of disenfranchised people that were placed in dungeons, sold at slave auctions, and died for freedom. The blueprint was written by undergreed and unknown grandmothers that never saw the inside of a college campus, but put their body on the line to make sure that segregation ended. The blueprint was written by men, both black and white, that sat in at lunch counters all over this nation. The blueprint was written by Brother Anthony Bowen, a former slave and the first black employee in the U.S. Patent Office who established the first YMCA to serve the African Americans in his community in 1853. And because of his sacrifice, hundreds of YMCA Achievers programs have sprung up all over the nation. And like Dr. King, we all have a blueprint that we must follow. And so finally, there is only one solution that can cure the ills of, of delusion. There's only one cure for the ills of diversion. And Tylenol isn't gonna fix that. And don't tell my grandmother, but goody powders and Benadryl won't fix it either. <laughs> but if you look at the blueprint, you'll find a good home remedy called devotion. Somebody say devotion. devotion. And the only way to be devoted, as my grandma would say, is look back from whence you came from and you'll see the victories that you've already won. And yes, there have been victories right here in Orlando. We've had folks that have passed by the bay, but chose not to rest at the bay. We've had resilient leaders that cried and wept at that bay, but chose not to sit at that bay. And if we learn anything today, we know not to sit at the bay, not only because the seats are filled, because there have been too many people that stood for us. And if civil rights didn't write your resume, civil rights made it sure that somebody would read your resume. Amen. Because we walked in here today and before we walked in here today, there was a Geraldine Thompson and a Katie Adams that refused to sit at the dock of the bay. Oh yes, there was a father pender at a Homer Hartage that refused to sit at the dock of the bay. There was an Alzo Reddick and a Belvin Perry that refused to sit at the dock of the bay. There was a Rufus Brooks and a Willie Gary that refused to sit at the dock of the bay. There was a Mabel Butler and a Daisy Lynham that refused to sit at the dock of the bay. But before there was an Al Lawson, before there was an Al C. Hastings, before there was a Camille Brown, before there were any of these people, there was a brother with swag, sauce, and sophistication. Uh, there was a brother that knew what he was doing. He broke down the barriers of segregation, and that brother was named Arthur Pappy Kennedy. And to his daughter and all of his family, thank you so much for your sacrifice and your service to this community. But I can see now Arthur Pappy Kennedy coming across that bay that he saw so many people sweat and sit at. And Arthur Pappy Kennedy probably looked at the bay, but decided to turn that bay into a bridge. And because he walked and built that bridge, I can walk across that bridge. You can walk across that bridge. Val and Jerry Jennings can walk across that bridge. 
Regina Hill can walk across that bridge. Chief Roger Williams can walk across that bridge. Commissioner Siplin can walk across that bridge. Tiffany Moore Russell can walk across that bridge. They can walk across that bridge because Arthur Pappy Kennedy fought so that we could win. But in researching bridges, I realized that bridges can't stand on their own. And so I did a little research in an encyclopedia. And I realized that a bridge needs something to get it upright, to make sure it doesn't tilt through storm and weather, uh, to make sure that when folks decide not to invest in certain communities, that, one, that bridge can outlast infrastructure changes. And as I look out into the audience, I see sponsors and supporters. And I'm convinced more than ever before that the YMCA of Central Florida has been that anchor, that anchor to make sure that our kids are picking up a book instead of struggling to pick up their pants, that anchor to make sure that our kids are running for office instead of running from the police officer, that bridge to make sure our kids from Carver Source can see a higher shore, to make sure that our kids from Paramore can grow up and want some more. But the work is not yet complete. The battle has not been won. We have our own bridges to build, and God did not save us to sit. He saved us to serve. And every day we edit our obituaries. And the question is, how will your story read? Uh, but what I know for sure is that the road to success is not straight. There's a curve called failure. There's loops called confusion. You'll have speed bumps called discrimination. But if you have a spare called determination, an engine called perseverance, a driver called the Lord, and an organization called the YMCA, you'll make it to a place called success. And when this and when this happens, we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we'll free at last. So in Spanish, I'll say vamos. In Thai, I'll say pita kain. In Arabic, I'll say lina hab. In Bangla, I'll say chala jao. If I was in a tiny village in South Africa, I'll just say on my side. But since I'm here in my own hometown of Orlando, I'll just say let's go, let's get off the bait, and I'll see you at work. Thank you.